Legends of Themyscira. It is I, your humble host, fellow monkey, chronicler of legend. And few there are more legendary than she that is known as the Wonder Woman. The legend that I bring you this day concerns itself with who she is and how she came to be. Join me, won't you? Released straight to disc in 2009, Wonder Woman is loosely based on the 1987 reboot of the character. The Princess of Themyscira delivers a castaway outsider back to his own world, but in the process, she learns of the modern world, though her main task is to defeat Ares, the God of War. <sighs> oh, Ares. You troublesome God of War. The horrors that you have caused. And the horrors that he continues to threaten to cause in a world of mutually assured destruction. Ah, but let us eschew the grotesqueries of geopolitics and instead focus upon our subject. The animated origins of Wonder Woman. It is an age long since past and the Queen of the Amazons stands against the forces of Ares, god of war. But Zeus himself demands that Ares be spared, and Hera commutes his sentence to one of life imprisonment. And so it is then that Ares is bound, separated from the psychic energies of war that have made him so powerful, and imprisoned. Ares' prison is Hippolyta's reward, a verdant paradise island, far from the jealous eyes of the world of man, where she and the Amazons can live in peace. A millennium passes, and upon the paradise isle of Themyscira, there is a princess of the Amazons. For you see, dear viewer, Queen Hippolyta had wished a child, and yet when Ares was involved, the product of that union was a bad seed indeed. Thus, when she came to Themyscira, she worked the sand and crafted a pure daughter. Behold then, the princess of Themyscira. But she too must know the prisoner of Themyscira. In the skies above, three American pilots are set upon by enemy forces. There is but one survivor, and he is fortunate enough that someone revealed land to him. And our errant American is brought before the Queen herself. I give you Colonel Stephen Rockwell Trevor, or Zipper as he is known in flight. Being that he is no threat to Themyscira or the Amazons in general, it is decided to return him to the world of men, and to decide a champion to accompany him, there is a great tournament. But even as an emissary is decided, there is betrayal at the prison door. Yes, Persephone, who wore her courage upon her face, had fallen in love with Ares, and sees this tournament distraction as the perfect opportunity to free her love. Fool indeed is any that falls in love with a god of war. In the meantime, it is Diana, princess of Themyscira, that wins the tournament, and takes the colours of her host nation as a gesture of peace. And so our heroine and her charge journey to the great city of New York. But for Diana, princess of the Amazons, this is indeed a disturbing future until he discovers the miracle that is Tequila. Ah, Tequila. I remember well the first day I sampled this magical elixir. I was at a Mexican air show. I was wary. But while an indiscretion of man is easily handled, a servant of Ares proves somewhat more troublesome. All of which leads our pair to the cult of Ares, and the gates of the underworld, 
which can only be opened with an offering of blood, which, despite our hero's best efforts, goes ahead as planned. Yes. And the God of War is made whole once again. Alas, Diana was injured in the battle, and was none too happy about being removed to live rather than suffer a warrior's death. Foolish indeed, for that she had died, there would be none left to challenge Ares. Or at least, none who belonged in a legend of Wonder Woman. And so, Ares makes ready to wage the final war, and conquer Olympus itself. But Diana will not stand to see it. And she is not alone in this. But Ares is war. And yet, he can still be defeated. And in the aftermath, Diana is made permanent emissary to the world of man. Such is the legend, at least in animated form, of the Wonder Woman. However, I cannot bring it upon myself to deem this legend worthy of remembrance. The women of Themyscira will always have an outsider's view of the male gender. They have isolated themselves from anyone or anything remotely male for over a thousand years. So when they speak of the worst excesses of toxic hypermasculinity, they can't know the truth of the everyday lives of the average dude. None of which really has much to do with this movie, so let's get back to it. And in truth, it's slightly muted being that they had to cut a lot of the more violent battle scenes to avoid the dreaded R rating. It's a violent movie. Death lurks around every corner, fragile humanity is constantly on show, and these Amazons are every bit the female equivalents of the 300 Spartans from that other movie. The voice performances are again somewhat stunt cast, though Alfred Molina's vastly underused and underrated talents lend a weight to the God of War that perhaps one of the usual suspects would lack. And how is it that Nathan Fillion so fills out the role of Steve Trevor? Or rather, this Steve, being somewhat of a womanising yet fragile flyboy. And while the script doesn't give our lead, Kerry Russell, much wiggle room in the main, we do see some flourishes in the early scenes, which help to flesh her out a little. All the while helped out by Tara Strong's Alexa. All in all, legendary voice director Andrea Romano brings out captivating performances from all the cast. But of course, this movie is animated, so what of the animation? Well, it is once again from the Warner Brothers stable that gave us the glory years of the 90s Batman series. Though the animation itself was handled by South Korea's MOI studio, which might explain the designs of Hades and Ares. The conflicting styles of East and West only help to emphasise the distinction between God and Amazon, or man. The emotions are slightly cartoonish, but only enough to convey dissatisfaction or stoicism, and occasionally snarling rage. But let's get right to it. I felt every word of the argument between Steve and Diana for him saving her over stopping Ares. He had to have known that she'd at least recover, and well enough to be able to stop Ares again the next year. But whatever the politics of the whole thing, is the story any good? Well, it's a little slight. Battle prologue into story of princess who dreams of seeing the world, gets her chance, but has to stop the god of war from being strong enough to conquer Olympus, fails at first attempt, straight into final battle. And at 68 minutes, plus 2 for credits, this movie still has its share of originitis. The grudge between Amazons and Ares needs to be set up, Themyscira needs to be set up, Steve Trevor needs to be set up, the Wonder Woman costume needs to be set up, all of which takes up around half the runtime leaving the hunt for Ares to fill out the second half. But it's not terrible, it's not nonsensical, and it flows well enough. In summary, it's not a kiddie choir to like Lego Batman, and it's certainly not going to appeal to certain sections of the male gender in the latter half of the 2010s, but neither is it a bad film, and it at least allows Diana to return to her homeland at any time. And with these words I direct you to the greatest of sights, the subscription button and its scintillating sidekick, the notification bell icon. And that you would be my hero, I direct you to the sacred texts below to find the path to my financial salvation.
or in your language, crowdfunding. I shall return seven days hence with another tale of a Lego Batman, perhaps one that you may recognise. Until that time, I remain your humble host, fellow monkey, chronicler of legend. And I bid you, dear viewer, good day.